Tell us about your decision to set the list price 30 percent higher for U.S. insurers than for government payers. Some are pointing out that U.S. taxpayers helped fund the NIH trial supporting uh, the data behind remdesivir's approval or emergency use authorization. Um, why set it 30 percent higher for U.S. insurance companies? Right. So, for uh, for everybody's knowledge, um, for every medicine in the United States, there are always two prices. There's a government price, and then there's a price for private insurers. That's part of the system in the United States, which uh, allows for required and expected discounts to the government off of every medicine accordingly. What I want to assure you, Meg, is that uh, at, at both of those prices, uh, we focused on making sure that uh, that all patients would have access. And based upon, you know, this price level, based upon the immediate savings to the healthcare system that this medicine provides, based upon programs from the government, whether you're covered by a private insurer, whether you're covered by a government insurer, whether you're uninsured uh, with COVID-19, uh, there will not be an issue with access for remdesivir. I just want to um, focus on that idea that there are two different prices a little bit, because you, you are saying that Gilead needed to take a different approach during a pandemic to pricing a medicine. But did the, the middlemen, the insurers, the, the folks that are benefiting from that difference between the, the net price and the gross price, they don't see the pandemic as a time when they need to be thinking differently about drug pricing? Well, I think, I think the community at large is definitely coming together to think about how to make sure that patients with COVID in the hospital system are well covered. And that's true from the government programs to the way the private insurers have approached this, to the way the CARES program is there for the uninsured patient populations, to the way that the research-based pharmaceutical industry has programs to make sure that if anybody needs support for their medicines, uh, they, they receive it. So I think the system comes together. The system, uh, you know, is such that uh, you do still have these two prices in the United States. But most importantly, I think the way that we price this assures that patients will have access to this medicine, regardless of how you're covered or not covered in the United States. I want to ask you also about supply. This is a difficult medicine to manufacture, and you've detailed how the company is working hard to increase the supply of it. Uh, now you say you expect to have 2 million treatment courses by the end of the year. Uh, HHS is now saying that they expect to get 100 percent of your production of the drug for July, 90 percent in August, 90 percent in September. Does the rest of the world get access to this medicine? Well, once again, Meg, I want to really thank the colleagues that I had the privilege of working with at Gilead, that uh, from the moment that we knew that this uh, medicine may be effective in COVID-19, we began to ramp up a very complicated supply chain, which used to take 12 months from start to finish. And now, as we enter into the second half of the year, we've reduced that down to around six months. What that means is that as we go into the second half of the year, we have kind of an exponential increase in supply, particularly starting in September, October, November, and December, where of the two million uh, treatment courses that cumulatively that we expect to have by the end of the year, you know, more than half of those will be available starting from September on. So uh, in the next several months, uh, where we have the greatest need in the developed world where the medicine is currently approved is here in the United States. So it makes sense to put uh, a large portion of our supply uh, to work for U.S. patients right now. And as we go into September and beyond uh, and we see where this disease goes uh, in the developed world, we'll be prepared with a supply that allows us to make sure that countries have what they need. I want to hey there. ask you also about the invest—oh, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, Dan, I just wanted to ask you about whether you'll, you expect to make a profit on remdesivir. You've said Gilead's expecting to spend up to a billion dollars uh, doing all of this investment in manufacturing and development. Will you make a profit this year on the drug? Well, Meg, I think that's a good question. I mean, at the end of the day, we're well aware of our dual responsibility here, which is, number one, to price it for access. We really wanted to make sure that immediately, when countries have approval for this medicine, that price in no way got in the way of patients receiving the medicine, which is why we priced it uh, at, at a level for the, if you like, the countries with the least purchasing power and gave that to every price, to take away those 
government price discussions that exist accordingly. Uh, and at the same time, we understand that we're at the beginning of our investment in remdesivir. As you know, based upon the three gold standard clinical trials, this has shown a significant effect in hospital patients. But we want to continue to see how we can increase that effect per, per, by combining this with other therapeutics, by bringing it earlier in the disease. And now we're just going to be beginning our, uh, our studies on the in, an inhaled version right. of this medicine so that perhaps we can get it outside the hospital. So we're well aware of our total responsibility here in terms of our ability to both invest for access and continue to, uh, to invest accordingly for the future of this medicine okay. and for the pandemic.